Thanks, Justin, and thanks, Caroline. Thanks for organizing. I think it's great to have um, kind of um, minor and finely tuned events and the plethora of events in the school's culture. This feels intimate to me. There's, I don't know how many, there's 20 or 38 or 30 people on the call, which is quite nice. So thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm going to admit right out front that I'm uh, I'm not going to be your best example of work-life balance. Um, I, I am in a position where I ought to be, you know, because I have um, a lot of colleagues um, <laughs> to, um, you know, set behavioral standards for and, um, and aspirational standards at the same time. Uh, so I know a lot about this topic, but I, um, I'm not the most work-life balanced example here. I am certain of that. Um, I want to recognize that also, you know, this is a topic that's been a, a constant in my firm for a good 15 years and quite seriously for seven or eight years when we actually embarked on a project to understand how we account for our time and what that meant for our workflow and what it meant for choices that people had in the practice, what it meant for flexibility and so on. But there's another uh, threshold that we need to identify right away, which is there's another kind of work-life balance after the isolation of COVID that hits very hard. And so uh, in some ways it's, it's a little bit like before Christ and after Christ. Um, it, it's a little bit pre-COVID and post-COVID. And of course they have to be one and the same, but there are some uh, things that have been exacerbated that I'll, I'll speak about in a minute. Um, balance suggests equilibrium. And I think equilibrium is rare. It's rare in ecology, as every person on this call knows. Uh, it's rare in politics. Um, and I think it's rare in work and life. And, uh, but it's really worth achieving if you can. Um, the biggest ingredient that makes me a happy person is that I love my work. I have two jobs, uh, they're both demanding. I love them both. And so my quotient, if there's a quotient, if there's an equation of some kind, ends up being on the very happy side because I love them both. And I'm fortunate because I'm able to love them because I've been able to choose them. And we don't all get to choose our place or our station. And we also don't all get to choose our assignments. Um, we don't get to choose our workload. And so again, I'm talking as the owner of a firm and as a teacher, I'm talking from a privileged place. I have to acknowledge that I have my hands on levers that I can move, I can change, and I have a lot of support in my world. I'm married to an artist who works a lot, and I don't have children. We live two people in a single family home. This is the first time we've lived in a single family home since before college, but um, in any case, I want to acknowledge that um, the parameters for work-life balance are not always in your control. And if they are, then you can make choices and you can do things. And so th that's crucial to me because, and it's not always recognized. Um, imbalance, I think comes from either being unhappy with the work or from a lack of control of your part in the work. I think, and it may also come from, you know, family life or, you know, relationship life or, you know, the cost of living is an extreme factor in work-life balance. Um, and that's been especially exacerbated in recent years here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, unforgivably costly place to live. Um, I have some important guides for myself. Uh, I exercise every day. I take a lot of vacations. 
I don't turn off on vacations, but I do take vacations. I get myself elsewhere. And I'm a creature of habit. I go to three or four places. And you know, those are my distractions. And um, that helps in the overall equation a lot. I, um, I cook on weekends. I never work on Saturdays if I can help it. Sunday is a wind up day for me usually. It's half New York Times and half preparation for the week. Uh, and so already, you know, I, I'm the, you know, sort of, I'm taking half weekends, I suppose. Um, bottom line issue for me, health comes first. If I'm not well, I'm not working. And if you're not well, I don't want you working with me. Uh, and I, that extends beyond um, physical pain. If you aren't feeling well, you are not feeling up to it. Change it, stop and ring, ring a bell and you know we'll get someone else to take on your assignment. And I also do try to make time for people because as a, an owner, I, I know that um, people need to be heard. And I think that's part of my balance because I have, that's a two way street. I get feedback and I know that I'm able to help people that I think that helps my life work balance and I know it helps staff and students as well. Um, another thing, I walk to work. I'm fortunate, you know, in a high cost city to be able to walk to my office and to be able to walk to the GSD. And what's important to me about that is that I'm always concocting narratives. And those of you who have studied with me know how important the narrative is in a project for me. And I usually make breakthroughs on my walk because I walk alone, I know the route, I mean, I'm a creature of habit, and I'm distracted by, you know, what's, what's at the front of my brain, and it actually helps a lot. Um, I'm going to say something about my early work life, because two things, really. One, uh, I was insecure. I, I think you all know me as a confident person, but um, I advanced well in school and I advanced quickly in professional life. And I often found myself being the youngest person in the room, but being asked the hardest questions or being asked to perform and feeling like an imposter sometimes. Um, I overcame that. I overcame it with experience and you know that helped. But everybody's professional development is a little bit different. And so again, there's no real equal there's no real equation that works for everybody. I was a perfectionist. And that is one of the criminals in work-life balance. Don't be a perfectionist. Find ways around perfectionism. Um, I remember, though, um, in the middle of my working years, when I was writing about Dan Kiley, he sent me a, an, an interview um, with him. It was in the local paper in Vermont. Uh, and the I don't remember why he needed to send that to me, but um, the questioner asked, um, when are you gonna retire? He's, I, think he, I think he was 89, because I knew him just at the end of his life. Um, I knew him in the last 20 years. Um, and he said, retire from what? And I loved it, but I also thought, okay, that's a marker. <laughs> it's like, as long as you love it, you don't feel the need to separate from it. Um, and then one final thing I think I want to say is, um, let's see what have I got for time here. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going over. Uh, post COVID, we've made a lot of accommodations. Um, it's been um, very, I mean, with respect to the practice, uh, we have spent a lot of time talking with each other and understanding what we needed to do to support people. Um, and I, I have to tell you that this part has been terrorizing for me. I know that I have young staff working in 500 square foot apartments with another roommate. I have students working in the same situations. They have to kind of walk into the next room if they you know, need to get away from noise. The most terrorizing thing for me um, has been to watch staff who are parents 
be forced to make decisions they should never ever have to make. And it's heartbreaking to me. And so, um, you know, we've done a lot in the firm to try and we've tried to be flexible for people. We've, you know, given people stipends to help support their daycare, childcare, or their pod, whatever. Um, I think it's become harder to get to equilibrium and work-life balance in the situation that we're in. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, you know, we were excited to capture um, the panelists that we did and um, the, we are very much anticipating the different um, positions everyone is in and um, just really appreciate your uni unique um, perspective. So um, thank you and Laura, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Gary and Jordan and Justin and Caroline it, and all of you that are here. It's it's really great to be a part of this discussion. And um, like I was mentioning, I think early on in the call to Caroline and Justin, I think it's just such an important topic. And I'm pleased to to see this conversation happening within school. And hopefully, it's something that will be ongoing. Um, so. I, I guess I wanted to start uh, by talking about a little bit of my time at the GSD and then kind of my experiences since and of course into you know the, the current situations we're in right now uh, that all of us are dealing with. Um, so when I was at the GSD, I <laughs> admittedly had zero work-life balance, which I'm sure is the case for many individuals. Um, and in a lot of ways, I was fine with that, um, or so I thought. I, you know, I love the immersive environment. It was, I met so many amazing people and had incredible uh, instructors and, um, you know, it's, it's such a stimulating environment. I think, you know, I, I feel really grateful for that experience. Um, but I also, you know, at the time didn't realize, it's hard to realize, I think, when you're in school, when you're in the midst of it all, um, that, for me, I was, you know, depriving myself of much needed personal life, um, especially with regards for me personally, especially with regards to my mental health. And I think that that um, is something that gets easily dismissed and is, you know, so important, like Gary was mentioning too, your physical health and mental health um, really comes above all else. And um, so, Upon graduation, when I was uh, getting into the workforce, um, I kind of had this idea of, I didn't really, I wasn't totally aware of it, but I kind of had this, I, this essentially this willingness to forego anything that wasn't work related because, you know, for one, I, I you know, I love what I do and I was excited about it. Um, and I felt that for me, for, you know, what I needed in my life at the time that felt like that would meet my needs. but. Um, it was interesting too, at the same time, one of the things that um, drew me to where I'm at now at Stimson, which um, it's about, it's been about eight years now there, um, there seemed to be this collective of individuals that had a mutual respect for work-life balance and had that, that conversation was happening and, uh, and I appreciated that a lot. And um, so once I started working there, it was funny because I didn't really realize it, but I was still carrying that mindset from school with me, you know, the way I was dealing with things. And, and in my personal way, I was, you know, willing to take on the load of work really for the sake of, you know, what I thought was doing my best and putting in my hardest effort. And again, of course, you know, in that case, I wasn't being particularly mindful of, you know, how it could be affecting my physical mental health, my relationships with people outside of work and things like that. And so, to be honest, it kind of took um, some rude awakenings from friends and family to really force myself to set boundaries between work and anything non-work related. And I think a big sticking point in my mind that I wasn't aware of that had developed for me during school. And I know this is not the case, you know, I'm just speaking of my personal experience. This is not the case for everyone, but 
I think in my mind, I had developed this, this notion that um, the amount of time that I spent working and the prioritization of work over all else was some kind of measure of my commitment and my work ethic and, and my passion for design. And I don't think that has to be the case. Um, so, you know, in some ways, um, you know, for what I need, it was sort of, uh, you know, reconfiguring of habits and, um, and it required me to kind of rethink, you know, what personal space and also how that relates to, you know, what I bring into the studio, what I bring in and share with my colleagues in terms of generating ideas and, and putting forth my best effort at work. Um, you know, it took some kind of redefining of what goes on in my personal life that can help me uh, feel fulfilled, you know, on both ends of the spectrum. And so, um, and also realizing how, you know, setting those boundaries and kind of constantly checking in with yourself on what those boundaries are for yourself. Again, it's, it's different for everyone. Um, you know, and, and of course, as Gary mentioned too, it's, it's never easy to achieve. Um, and I still struggle with it all the time. Um, but, you know, constantly, tr you know, being mindful of that, um, you know, as, as early as you can do that, you know, even throughout school, um, it really helps you strengthen your work in the studio. And so, you know, it's taken me a long time and still, <laughs> I still work at it all the time. And it's an ever evolving process. I think that's different for everyone, of course. But, um, you know, I think that it's, it takes courage and takes a lot of work to, you know, set those boundaries. And so it's something that's interesting for me as I, you know, take on more responsibilities at work and have grown into a more senior position. I recognize the position of power that I'm in. And, and one thing that I, you know, take very seriously is, you know, looking out for junior staff, looking out for my peers and, you know, checking in with folks and seeing how they're doing and kind of recognizing that um, sometimes people may not feel comfortable stating or putting forth their work-life boundaries or, or setting those boundaries because of power dynamics, because of, you know, fear of expressing oneself and then fear that that's going to somehow be held against you. And, and I think, you know, so I think it's, it's a two way street in terms of, you know, needing to do as much as you can to self advocate for that time and space, however that is defined for you. Um, but also, I think in the position that I'm in and, and my peers and, and other leaders in practice, um, I think it's important for us to be super mindful and and communicate as much as possible, check in with people as much as possible and really um, help people create that space if it seems like they're not able to create that for themselves or if the work conditions that we're providing are not working. You know, we want everyone to do their best and so it's in our best interest to help each other out, you know. So I think that, you know, that's something that I really take seriously. And I think it's especially critical in the state of the world that we're in right now. Um, you know, as Gary mentioned too, it's, it's unbelievable. I'm not a parent and I can't even imagine how difficult it is. I, I you know, I understand, I see the, you know, the struggles that uh, a number of people are going through in my office. And of course, you know, everywhere it's, it's kind of like the, the situation right now, of course, is, is amplified, magnified, and exacerbated. Um, just all of the difficulties that, and complexities that people have in their lives. And, um, and so I think that, you know, I see it as a responsibility for, you know, however I can in my position to, you know, really just try to help my peers out, help junior staff out, and, you know, see how we can just kind of, we just kind of need to, I mean, I guess maybe it sounds cheesy, but we need to just look out for each other, you know? And I think that um, keeping that in mind as a core part of how we do work on the day-to-day -day is, um, 
just really critical. And so for me, as far as I'll just say real quick, as far as, you know, how I try to carve out time for myself outside of work, I think I find that um, it's really important for me to take breaks and when I'm able to and surround myself with music, just listen to lots of music. Sometimes I play music with various little instruments that I have, even just like literally making noise in my apartment with my partner, with a harmonica and flute and things like that, things that I happen to have, which I'm fortunate to have. And um, going for long walks, um, that was something that I used to do that was a great release during grad school too, is you know, every Friday night, I would go and take a long walk by myself to clear my head. And um, I found that to be an important kind of routine for me to stick to. And it's something that I try to stick to now as well. Um, so I think that, you know, it's again, it's an ever evolving process. And I think that um, those of us that are in positions of leadership, whatever we can do to help, you know, other members of our work community and our outer communities, you know, thrive, you know, all the better. So, yeah. So I got that. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura. Jordan, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Just give me one second. I do have a few slides. Okay, can everyone see the slides, Justin? Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks so much, Justin, Caroline, for having us, uh, facilitating it. Honored to be included uh, with Gary and Laura in this discussion. So my name is Jordan Locke Crabtree, where Locke Collective has its name. Um, I'm a husband to Megan and father to Levi. Uh, these are my little ones uh, that we are, you know, working through as you guys are discussing having little kids in COVID. Thankfully, neither are in school yet. Uh, we live in historic district of Annapolis, Maryland, where the studio is also located. Uh, I'm the founder and principal of Lock Collective. And then along with being a landscape architect, uh, my wife, Megan and I also work, we've, uh, we've acquired, renovated, managed seven different historic rental units in Annapolis. You'll kind of see that play through a little bit of this. Um, so I'm gonna share a little of my life story and how I came to be so intent on creating a balance between work and life um, or rhythms as I prefer to call them. Uh, I understand that everyone who's a student at the GSD most likely excelled in your undergraduate studies, your work experiences before, uh, just to get accepted. Uh, I think that's kind of a, an understanding. Uh, so as I share about my life, please take any achievements mentioned as part of the narrative that kind of led me to realize that I was pursuing life with a set of imbalanced values that only became apparent probably more recently, uh, similar to what Gary touched on in his early career. Uh, and so if any message is taken away from what I share, I hope it is to pause, take a breath and assess what is important to you and what is driving your decisions. So my mother and father raised me and my two brothers in Maryland, uh, right on the Chesapeake Bay. This is uh, one of our projects uh, much further away from where we grew up. Uh, so both of my parents were from working class Appalachian families. Uh, they taught us how to work hard by modeling it for us. Um, neither of my parents having gone to college, they really desired us to do so. Placed us in the top college prep schools, uh, parents instilled in us this love for nature. Uh, this is the family, my aunt's family farm where we grew up in the summer is just exploring uh, hundreds of acres. Uh, so they really, you know, gave me this love through hiking, fishing, swimming, and just will ever be ever thankful to them for this gift of loving nature and also learning how to work hard. Uh, so to give some background on my personality, if anyone's taken personality work type tests, um, you'll see through my type how easily my work-life balance could, has, and can be weighted towards working too much. Um, so with the Myers-Briggs, I'm an ENFP, which is nicknamed the champion. Um, I gravitate towards its other name now, which is the inspirer. Uh, through the lens of the Enneagram, I'm a three, which is called the achiever. 
defined by uh, people think of them as success driven, excelling, image conscious. Um, probably hence why I, I stage myself in front of our cool shelves here. Uh, so I graduated college during the 2009 recession and started working where I'd interned with Kate Orff at Scape Studio in New York. Uh, I think there were only seven of us at the time when I got started and really learned from Kate and Elena and the team how to approach the landscape in innovative ways. And I think what I've best termed experimental design, I think at that time is what I kind of gathered from them, really being able to just try new things. And so from Manhattan, um, I went down to Chile to work for now Pritzker Prize winning Alejandro Arvina and well-known landscape designer, Teresa Moeller. So I truly had desired to work with Teresa solely and ultimately did, um, especially after Alejandro's team informed me in my third interview that, uh, quote, he does not pay internationals as they receive the opportunity to work with him. Um, so I saw a clear imbalance there. Um, and thankfully I ended up uh, with Terry. Uh, she taught me how to seek a sensitivity in the landscape, how to draw inspiration from the site. Uh, she'd have me go to the project site and would tell me just to be there uh, for hours and just take in what I felt. Um, she treated me as a son while I was there and would kick everyone out of the office at the end of each workday. Uh, workdays ended at six after we had an hour and a half lunch in the middle of the day. Um, and she did not let anyone work late, big one family. Uh, I think the entire time I was there I only worked one evening uh, because we decided to enter a contest together. And so coming back to the States, um, I took a job at a startup studio now called Campion Ruby. I was the third employee. Kevin Campion and I had been connected by our mutual mentor and our mentor had insisted that we just needed to work together. So it's this incredible opportunity to see firsthand how to build a design studio, how to learn planting design. I got to interact, you know, being in such a small studio, taking on responsibility really early, interacting with clients and so much more. Uh, so a few years later at age 28, I found myself working at Camping Ruby. Uh, I was the most senior person under the two owners, a team of about 14 people. Uh, the studio grew quickly and started producing really high quality work. Uh, was being published, awarded nationally. Um, so it doesn't really seem like there was a problem, but I was really tired. I was worn down. I wasn't sleeping enough. Um, I was working about 55, 60 hours a week on my job. Megan and I were renovating a 150 year old four unit historic home. Uh, we had a baby on the way, our first uh, leadership roles in my church, I was racing sailboats, probably other stuff. And so it was in this season, I got invited to speak at the International Federation, IFLA, the Africa Conference on designing in the developing world from my time in South America. So Megan and I took this trip and uh, we decided to, before we became a family of three, to use it to see, you know, what do we, what do we want in this next phase of life? What are we really seeking to do? Because uh, clearly we were exhausted. Uh, I was really exhausted. And so while there in Kenya, we visited a dear friend, Chloe Humphreys. Uh, she has the landscape studio now out of France, previously out of Kenya. Um, and we had worked together at Terry's office and she had just launched. And so, you know, really got me thinking, is it time to launch my own design studio? And I had known since college that I either wanted to launch a design studio or become a partner in one. Um, so we came back, we thought about it kind of wrote out like, what do we really want out of this? So these are kind of the, some of the guiding principles that I went into this with. I wanted to do meaningful work. Um, I wanted to design the type of uh, aesthetic and approach, which is a minimalist landscapes. I wanted to work less hours to be with my family and friends and hopefully have a greater income in the process to just free up more time now and later. So considering this, I saw two problems. The first, how do we, my family, live in a more meaningful and purposeful way uh, with more time for family, friends, uh, and rest? And two, uh, do I keep working at the studio, eventually become a partner, hopefully, or jump out and start my own and maybe work less? Um, and so at this time, I was reading uh, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. He's the Austrian Holocaust survivor and psychiatrist. And uh, my father-in-law 
father-in-law and I would meet in pubs and read books together. And we were talking about this and these ideas. And he just said, you and Megan really need to have a day each week where you just don't do anything. Uh, he's like, just start there. That's like step one. And so Megan and I knew we needed to do it. And so we really kind of took that on uh, as we were having our first kid. And so with our faith as well as followers of Jesus, we kind of took on this, like, what are the Sabbath principles that come out of the, you know, Judeo-Christian tradition and really started to study that, look at it. How does that fit into our, not only just having a day a week where we just get to be together and have fun, um, but what does that look like during the week in the evenings and the mornings? Um, how do we get rest? So uh, problem number two, thinking about, should I start this practice? I found myself at the LAF summit uh, in 2016, the 50 year anniversary. And there was a panel of, uh, it was kind of the elder top, you know, six of the top landscape architects on the panel. Um, I mean, Gary, maybe you were even one of them, I don't know. And um, I just remember this question being asked by someone, how old were each of you when you started your own practice? And the age is kind of like, spattered around and all of them kind of honed in around age 30 that they had just kind of decided to go for it. So it seemed like a sign for me. Um, so I launched out uh, Lock Collective. I knew I really wanted to, to do this. Um, thought it was a risk taker. You know, I used to race rally cars. I used to race mountain bikes, uh, but this decision was totally different. Laura kind of touched on, you know, seeing these insecurities come up. So I began to realize that my self-worth kind of had always been tied up in what I did, being the top student, captain of the soccer team, graduating designer, top firm, best employee, best husband, whatever it is. Um, and I now was trying to start this firm that aimed for excellence, but I somehow wanted to work less. And those just seemed like two opposing goals. Uh, what had always worked was go until it hurts and work hard and it just kept working out. So kind of getting this idea that I really needed to uh, reset my net, net worth, self-worth um, and deciding to really it's time to launch this new studio. Um, so the fear is kind of becoming, um, can I do this? Can we work less? Can I find these clients? Um, are my wife and I gonna end up living on the street with our newborn kid? Um, thankfully, none of these happened and we formed Lock Collective for I started out, um, so our mission statement read and still does. We design minimalist landscape for connection to others and nature. We aim to bring nature into a person's daily life and draw people out into nature. So we design gardens for private residents and estates, for eco boutique rural developments, uh, institutional corporations, urban development. Uh, we work on projects across the country internationally and we're, we kind of fluctuate around three to four people. Um, so looking at how it's gone over the past, it's only been about four and a half years. So previously I was working 50 to 60 hour weeks, um, in, as a landscape architect and since launching it and tracking time and kind of working in this intentional way, I've cut back to about 33 hours a week. If I take the whole four and a half years into consideration, um, thankfully my wife, two sons and I still have a house not living on the street and uh, strategically working fewer hours from this place of rest has led to this feeling of a more fulfilled, profitable, enjoyable vocation. Um, and we've still, as Lock Collective received ASLA awards. Uh, we received the top one in our chapter this past year. Uh, we've been published and got it into Dwell and Architectural Digest and got to work with great architects and clients. And so I'm very aware that this is a lucky, privileged and blessed situation that it might not have worked out this way, um, but it's at least worth considering that it did work out and that we did uh, choose to work less and it still led to creating meaningful work. And so how this applies to employees um, in the firm, because I don't want it to just be for myself. Um, so whenever an employee starts, they're offered a, it's a discussion about how many hours they want to work. And so I've had some just out of school, they say, I just want to work 50 hours and get paid for that. So I said, okay, um, pretty soon after they wanted to work 40 hours and found themselves more productive in that. Uh, another employee is a mother who's doing homeschool pre COVID um, and she's adjusted her hours seasonally. We would kind of take it every about twice a year and she'd say, okay, I, I can give 20 hours this season. I can give 10, I can give 30 and really just making that work. Um, 
And so how many hours an employee is just a discussion we have at the beginning and kind of ongoing through the year. Um, okay, so some advice um, I'm thinking about my time. So um, overworking is proven, Stanford University, and I'll send out some resources if Carolyn and Justin can pass out, have proven that there is a decline on return uh, for working more, your productivity, it goes down along with happiness. Um, so I really recommend trying to do a daily schedule. And I did this even when I was in school, but like having a, pretending like it was a job, having a time to work, having time to exercise, having a time to rest, whatever's important to you in that. And there's also seasons where it's just not possible. You guys are in uh, at the GSD and I know that is a all consuming thing. Um, so there's gonna be totally unbalanced weeks, but finding a way to take balance when you guys have breaks. Um, you know, right now in my wife and I's life, uh, my mother is ALS and I'm her main caretaker. So we just decided looking at the air, okay, I'm gonna work less. Uh, I'm probably not getting enough sleep, but I also have toddlers, so it's not possible. Um, so we've traded this time. So we've said, okay, I'm gonna work a little bit less and get this privilege to be with my mom uh, in the season. And then under it, kind of the last thought on that is just really, I think and Gary and Laura both mentioned this in some way with insecurity, with mental health, like what are the underlying drivers and desires that you guys are looking at to work, to do well, to excel as you guys have clearly all done to be there um, and how to balance this out. And I'll send some of these out I'm gonna wrap up so we have time, but this is kind of like example of how my wife and I try to look at like, what is our ideal schedule through a day? How do we limit ourselves to contain work? Um, how do we have fun? Uh, the other being, how do we approach a day to be productive as best we can within a smaller amount of time? Um, I, I'm also very big on getting away from my iPhone and technology when possible. Um, Light phone is an amazing thing if you guys ever check it out. And I'll shoot these uh, resources out. Uh, thanks for the time. Sorry if I went over some there. Thank you. That's great. Um, we are gonna open it up to everyone to ask questions and open up to a casual discussion. So if people feel comfortable. It'd be great if you could turn your cameras on and chime in, but I'm gonna start us off with a question um, for Laura, Gary, and Jordan. Um, Jordan, you mentioned that when you were working for Teresa Muller, she encouraged you to sit in the site for over an hour um, to really understand the site. And um, that would later influence your design of the site. And Gary, you talked about um, your walks to work as being where you have your biggest breakthrough. And I am wondering, in what ways y'all feel that rest and recreation actively contribute to your design practice and are actually part of the design work that we do? I'll speak first. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, Teresa's that, and especially when it's a project where, especially you're traveling to have a few days to spend you know, getting to spend different times a day. I think it's just invaluable to, to be there kind of unplugged and not trying to inventory, take things in or, um, but really just be there. I think like Gary said, the silence is a really good thing. Getting to learn uh, what's there um, is inspiring. I love what you said about Teresa. <laughs> That's like, she has the, she's the, maybe the most centered person I know next to my wife, uh, which is another thing that allows me to be balanced. I have an even more balanced partner. Um, you know, what I really mean about my, so I don't I do not do a lot of recreation to be truthful. Um, I, I, it's, I like to cook and I have a kitchen that's fun to cook. So um, my, that's my biggest distraction week to week. And, you know, now sometimes I'm doing it both Saturdays and Sundays. I can't do it during the week. There's just no way. But the walking thing is honestly about sentences. I, um, I'm finding, um, I'm looking for the, the starter sentence or the, the closing paragraph um, on whatever I'm working on. And I just find that, uh, you know, writing is a practice it's, and it, it comes through iteration. 
and I don't mean necessarily that I'm doing that to write an article. I always have two or three things in process in writing, but 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 also just composing the story of a project for a presentation tomorrow morning. Um, I just find that the 20 minute or the 40 minute walk I have to um, really enable me to do that. But I, I don't do a lot of mountain climbing or like I don't ride bikes because I'm scared of injury. <laughs> um, and so um, music and cooking, that's what does it for me. Yeah, and I think one thing that's interesting too that that I think has probably drawn many of us to the profession is that I think that you know we all have a designer mindset and a designer lens and so even outside of work the life that you're experiencing the hobbies and time with friends and loved ones, family members is still, there's, there's still your kind of designer perspective, you know? And so I think that without realizing it, that, you know, it's all, it's all beneficial here. There's all stuff to be gained. And, and sometimes even in those moments, it's, you know, it, you don't think of it that way, but it, it can come back as inspiration later. Um, you know, even like, thinking about, you know, even something just like listening to music or whatever, I think is, it can be powerful because it can trigger memories. It can trigger memories of a place, a place that has certain materiality that's really um, inspiring, things like that. You know, th there are all sorts of, you know, phenomenal ways that things through your life can be linked and kind of find it, find their way back into design and your, and your design thinking. So. I think it's it's kind of kind of always there. So I think all of the time, you know, that doesn't feel like it's defined as I'm at work or I'm in the studio. Um, it's kind of all still happening. So I think that's. I, so I think all the time outside of work is, you know, just as valuable for sure. Um, oh, Alana, do you have a question? Raise your hand. Hi. Yeah, I do. Thank you. Um, thank you all for sharing. It's it's really great to hear um, some kind of honest accounts of of the world. Um, so thank you. I so I guess I'm um, I'm kind of reflecting on a not super enjoyable uh, experience I had uh, working in a large New York firm and um, where people were not very happy doing the work that they were doing. Um, and I'm, I think I'm thinking about how the structure of the organization was really one of the things that caused that where like, regardless of how much people tried to take care of each other, um, there, there was simply just an aspect of like corporate ladder climbing that needed to happen. Um, that kind of over was, was overriding any kind of like interpersonal, um, joy <laughs> and support. So I guess I'm wondering, you know, what you all think about in your respective positions, um, how you would ideally um, restructure or structure uh, a kind of design environment. Um, and then also your advice for us, um, as a lot of us are kind of seeking jobs for, for 2021, um, you know, how to, how to navigate that as someone with like pretty much no leverage. Um, to, to kind of just, <laughs> yeah, how to, how to have those conversations. It's good to see you, Alana. I, I have two things I can say. Um, one is that um, Laura raised a, a point which I think is really vitally important, um, which is that when people make choices to not be at work, even in the face of extraordinary deadlines and pressure. It isn't because they're not committed. And it's because they have something else and we need to respect that. And sometimes that gets to be fuzzy and gray and um, subjective and angry. 
but it's fundamentally true that um, making the judgment that someone lacks commitment to the field or commitment to the work or, or to their community because they have to leave at six doesn't fly, not, not good. Second thing is um, maybe, maybe a little more complex, um, which has to do with structure. I, you know, Doug Reed and I worked really hard in the first dozen years of our practice to try to not have titles and not have um, structure to be as organic, we use that word all the time, as we could try not to have too many policies. But as our work got more complex, um, you know, we, we learned maybe the hard way that um, firms need hierarchy. They need to have it. Um, and that's because there's more than project work to the culture of a firm. There's uh, external relations, there's relationship building, um, you know, there's positioning, there's going after work there, and and um, and then there's just operations and finance and so on. So we we realized, you know, through the help of a very good advisor who's been who helped us to put the firm together and still advises us that um, uh, this was a two way thing. You needed to re recognize people's achievement and give them responsibility. So the title came with responsibility, but uh, not without consequence, right? So some people didn't get titles. So that's pretty tricky. Um, I could go on and on about this. And that's, that's, this is more professional practice class maybe, but um, I, I, I think that the, the feeling you describe, Alana, is really unfortunate and um, I work really hard in my firm for that not to happen. I'll just be honest about it. And if we detect it, we go after it. Um, because I was being very truthful when I said that you can't have balance with life and work if either one or the other isn't giving you satisfaction. You can't. So if there's an equation, it's, a, it's that zero sum one. <laughs> it's, you know, both have to be happy, uh, both have to be satisfied. Um, and if they're not, then something's wrong. And I'll say, I think something I've really enjoyed um, seeing when I interview someone or they come in, uh, Alana, is that they're confident enough to bring to me some things and say, listen, like, this is my family situation, life situation, or this is just how I want to live. I, you know, I'm training for something or they don't tell me, but they just say, I really just want to work 40 hours. And I never see it as a negative. I see it as this person's confident enough to have made a decision to bring it up to me, to put it on the line if we're thinking about hiring them. Um, so I would not feel like as a, someone looking for a job that you have no power or anything or no chips, but always feeling confident. And if it's not, it's not recognized, I mean, maybe that's not the place you'd want to be in a pretty good indicator. Yeah, and it's tough because um, I would, I guess just um, reiterate what I was saying too about um, how, you know, I think it's, it's really, it can be difficult and I know, um, Jordan and Gary have both mentioned this too, just how difficult it can be for someone that's that's entry level that that feels like they have no leverage or power um, to feel comfortable coming forth with that. And so I think that, you know, I think it is part of the responsibility of the leadership and like what Gary was describing, which is awesome, um, to be mindful of that and to really have, you know, honest conversations with staff, really check in with people as much as possible and to build these relationships where you're, you're really, you're building an environment where individuals can feel comfortable 
saying, hey, I need this time, or this is this is the balance I need, this is this is the schedule I need. Um, because you know, so in some cases, even as much as someone wants that, they may still be afraid to ask. And I think that um, you know, it's something that leadership in general across the board, we just need to be more mindful of, you know, the part that we play in that and how we can um, strengthen that culture of care and well-being for one another. Thank you guys. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Jazz, I want to be respectful. We said that this would end at two, so. Yeah, I got class at two, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, thank you guys for joining and giving your advice on all these things. Um, I actually feel like I might be in a little opposite pocket of Alana where I've worked in very teeny tiny firms that have been extremely, you know, accommodating and welcoming and um, they're open to having discussions. Um, the issue that I keep running into because they're so small is that you kind of get sucked into someone else's schedule or someone else's idea of, of what feels right for them. Um, I'm personally, I do much better, you know, doing a lot of my brunt work much earlier than most people, <laughs> most, most people in the firm. Like I would rather come in at six and leave at three versus if you keep coming in at nine and leave at five or six, for example. Um, so as an employee, do you have any suggestions on how to um, maybe ask for that accommodation. I know Jordan, you mentioned you do that at the beginning stages, but I feel like I kind of work that out as I'm, you know, working through, or once I've joined a firm, it takes a little time to figure out that flow. Um, so just generally speaking, what, what would you recommend as a good way to kind of reconfront that or realign something? I think that one thing that might be helpful, I guess, is, you know, the beginning of when, when you're starting out in a position, um, it's great that, like you were saying, and like Jordan was saying, that that conversation in Jordan's firm is happening early on. Um, but I think that, um, to your point, Jazz, that um, it takes figuring out to, to figure out what you need. Um, I think that it it's great to set some kind of check-in points. Um, if, if not, you know, very regularly check-in points, you know, ask for periodic check-ins, you know, every few months or something like that, where you can sit down with your employers and, and talk about, okay, my, I see my schedule changing. I see my needs changing. This is, you know, this is something that I'd like to talk with you about and kind of getting, getting some of that stuff set in the schedule so that, you know, you can feel comfortable, you know, knowing that, okay, I'm going to have this check-in soon and, you know, we're going to touch base on all this stuff. And, and this is something that I want to talk about. Um, I think that finding a way to, to communicate that is, is helpful. And also, again, hopefully, you know, the, the work environment that you go to, hopefully the employers are also, you know, offering that up already. Um, but I think that's something that's, you know, always great to ask for. Um, Check-ins are always great. So yeah, I think that's a good starting point. Okay. Don't be shy, Don't be shy. talk about it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to stay on if, if y'all are able to stay on, but I also want to be respectful of people's time. It's now 2.01. Um, it was, I'm really glad we got to do this. It was hard to get people's schedules um, to coordinate because you guys have great work-life balance. Um, and this has been really helpful for me. I hope this is a conversation we can open up to at the GSD to our professors. Um, Gary, maybe you could help us. Um, yeah, thank you guys. Yeah, this was like that, yeah. such a rich discussion and um, was so pleasantly surprised by um, a lot of topics coming up that I wouldn't have anticipated. So thank you, everyone. Thanks to you all. For thank you. Well, Take care.
Yeah, take care. Bye. Bye, Laura. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, Jordan.